Transfiguration. It kind of makes you scratch your head a little bit, doesn't it? What's the point of it? Why did Jesus do that? Why did Jesus do that for Peter, Andrew, not Andrew, James and John? What, what does it mean? What does it mean for us? You ever thought about that? Why, transfiguration. Why dedicate an entire Sunday, an entire Sunday of the church year, to transfiguration? And why put that Sunday of the church year right at the end of the season of Epiphany and right before the, the start of the season of Lent? Why focus on it? What, what does it mean for us? How will it help us? Transfiguration. What will it do for us today? Tomorrow? Next week? In life? Throughout life? For eternal life? Transfiguration kind of makes us scratch our head a little bit, doesn't it? Should we go along? Should we go along with Jesus? Should we go along with Jesus up that mountain? Should we go along with Peter, James, and John up that high mountain where they were all alone, where Jesus was transfigured before them? Let's, let's do that. Let's do that together as one. But rather than tagging along with the obvious, with, with Peter... This morning, let's, let's tag along with John. And let's see what, if anything, might have caused him to scratch his head a little bit that day. And let's see if John got any answers to some of the questions we're, we're asking th this morning. Why did Jesus do that? What, what does it mean? What does it mean for us? How will it help us? What will it do for us today, tomorrow, next week? in life, throughout life, for eternal life. Taking along with John, because John was there a, a week earlier, six days prior to this. John was there when Jesus was speaking to them, the disciples, the apostles. When he was teaching them, when he said, the Son of Man must suffer many things. The Son of Man must be rejected by the elders, chief priests, teachers, of law. The Son of Man must be killed. And the Son of Man must rise again. Did any of that, did all of that suffering, rejection, being killed, rising, did any of that cause John to scratch his head a little bit that day? If not that, then maybe Peter's reaction, Peter's response, because Peter literally pulls Jesus aside. And Peter is going to rebuke Jesus. And Peter's going to say, never, Lord, that'll, that'll never happen to you. Is John scratching his head there? Peter, what are you doing? That's, that's the Lord. You can't talk to him that way. And if that, if Peter didn't get John to scratch his head, well, then maybe the Lord's response? The Lord's going to look right at Peter. He's going to look him right in the eye. And he's going to say, get behind me, Satan. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. John kind of turning away and scratching his head. He just called Peter Satan. Why would he do that? And Jesus is going to keep teaching that same day, the same conversation, the same series of conversations. He's going to say some strange things. Take up your cross. If anyone wants to follow me, he must deny himself. Take up his cross and follow me. Scratching his head. What, what are, deny yourself, Lord? To take up a cross? How much of this is John listening to and scratching his head? There's Peter and Jesus. Never, Lord, get behind me, Satan. Deny yourself. Take up your cross. And Jesus is going to go on. If, if you want to save your life, you got to lose it. And you're going to have to forfeit your soul to gain eternal life. 
throughout that week, how many times is John replaying those conversations in his mind and, and maybe scratching his head over all of it? After six days, six days after all of that, Jesus took Peter and James and John up this high mountain where they were all alone. But maybe John's wondering, wait a minute, why just us? Why the three of us? Why, why not the other nine? Why isn't everyone going along here? And wh where are we going, by the way? Why, why, why did we get singled out to, to hike up this mountain for this exhausting climb? And, and by the way, how much further? How, how much longer? Are we, are we going all the way to the top? What are we going to do when we get there, wherever there happens to be? Is John scratching his head at all? They go up that mountain together with Jesus. And then it happened. Jesus was transfigured before them. His clothing became dazzling white, whiter than anyone could, could bleach it. And his face shone like the sun. And the whole scene was brighter than a flash of lightning. There he was, his rabbi, his, his teacher, his friend, and he was changed, he was transformed, he was glorious. And John's down on the ground, face down on the ground in fear, terrified. Physically, is he even able to scratch his head? He's wondering, what's going on here? Why is this happening? Why is Jesus showing this to me? And then, out of nowhere, there's two men with him. There's Moses and Elijah, and he's wondering, why are they here, and how do I even know who they are, and what are they doing with Jesus? And they're talking about something. What are they talking about? They're talking about his departure. Well, what is his departure? John is listening to us. He's seeing all this, maybe scratching his head a little bit. What's going on here? And then he hears a voice. It's the voice of Peter again. And Peter's talking to Jesus, and he's talking about Elijah and Moses and shelters and tents. And is John saying, Peter, what are you doing? Don't talk to Jesus. Look at him. They don't need your help. They don't need your bright ideas. Button it. And, and then another head scratcher rolls in, literally rolls in this mysterious, this this glorious cloud, and, and it just surrounds all of them on that mountain. And there's a voice. No, it's not Peter's. But it's a, a voice he's heard. A voice he heard at, at Jesus' baptism in the Jordan. A voice from heaven, the voice of the Father saying, this is my son whom I love. And then he adds, listen to him. Scratching his head in awe, in amazement, in a holy fear, in a terrified fear and then just like that it's gone all of it's gone the voice grows silent Moses and Elijah vanish the cloud dissipates Jesus glory is once again hidden John's still on the ground scratching his head what what just happened and just like that there's a tap perhaps on his shoulder and he looks up, and there's the face, the normal face of Jesus looking down at him, perhaps with a smile, maybe extending his hand to help him up. Why did Jesus do that? Why did Jesus do that for me as they're going down the mountain? And then Jesus says something. He addresses them sternly. He, it's a warning. It's a command. It's a demand. Don't tell anyone what you saw until the Son of Man rises from the dead. Well, there it is again, rise, the Son of Man rising from the dead. He just heard that the week, week before, and now he hears it again, and he's going down the Mount of Glory, wondering what all this means, transfiguration, suffering, rising from the dead. Well, we take along with John up that Mount of Glory, because John's going to be there on another Mount of Glory a far different mountain and a far different glory, Golgotha, Calvary, outside Jerusalem, hanging on a cross, pinned in place. Not Moses and Elijah, but two criminals crucified, one on his right, one, one on his left, and no mysterious, no glorious cloud that day, just darkness is going to cover the land. 
And no voice from the Father. He's not going to speak that, that day because he's abandoned his son. He's forsaken his son, literally turned his back on, on his son because on that day he's not pleased in his son. Not one bit, not at all. Because that day, hanging on that cross, pinned in place, his son is carrying our guilt. And he's bearing our shame. And he's covered with our sin. A far different glory on that mountain. It's a hidden glory. A glory hidden in thorns and nails. A, a glory a glory hidden in suffering and, and death. A glory hidden in blood and sweat. A glory hidden in the words, Father, forgive them. A glory hidden in it's finished. Paid in full. A glory hidden, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. John, on that mount of glory, scratching his head over a dead body and a huge stone and a sealed tomb. Scratching his head that night all day Saturday, early in the morning on Sunday, and then a foot race, literal foot race out to the tomb, greeted by angels. See the place where they laid him? He's not here. He's risen just as he said. There it is again. Rising from the dead. Maybe for the first time, John's no longer scratching his head. Because it's starting to make sense. The son of man. No, wait. The son of God. True God, true man, one person, Jesus, the seed of the woman, the promised Messiah, the, the Savior, the, the Christ. The Christ must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, teachers of the law, and he must be killed. And on the third day, be raised to life. John got it. He says so in his gospel, inside that tomb. And we get it too, by faith in the pages of his word. And yet we're still left scratching our heads, aren't we? Scratching our heads not in confusion, but in amazement and wonder and awe. He did that for us. Jesus did. He did that for us. God did. He became one of us. He was born of a woman. He was born under law. He, he kept that law. He obeyed in our place. Jesus did. God did. He became obedient to death, even death on a cross. He paid the wages of our sin. He washed our sins away in his blood, Jesus did. God did. We're left scratching our heads because we didn't deserve that. We didn't earn that. He did, did that not because of anything in us, he did that because of everything in him. We're just left scratching our heads at the grace and mercy and compassion of our loving God. We're left scratching our, our heads at the comfort and peace and hope of our forgiving God. Two mountains, very different mountains, two glories, very different glories, but one Lord, one Savior, the God-man, Jesus Christ. Amen.